Hello and welcome to another episode of A Conversation With. Uh, normally Jennifer Kirk is hosting this, but of course today Jennifer Kirk is the participant that we're having a conversation with. So I'm in the hot seat and uh, I've got with me Jennifer Kirk. Today's video is sponsored by Trainomatic, makers of DCC decoders designed to be fully compatible with every manufacturer's locomotive. everyone welcome to a conversation with jenny kirk and it's jenny kirk in conversation with jenny kirk sort of well the cupboard monkey anyway um but it's really great to see you all i hope i find you well and today this is the questions that came in through the patreon so we asked the patreons what questions do you have for me and uh, we've actually had a couple of weeks for those to come in and gosh, there's a lot of pent up questions there. Uh, they've all come through. We've collated them and the cupboard monkey is now going to uh, um, uh, ask me those questions and hopefully I'll have an answer for you. First of all, Jennifer, you've mentioned many times in previous discussions with various people that it was your dad who got you into the hobby. He uh, he wanted to play trains and uh, you were the one that took the bait in helping out. So. My question has to be, what part of uh, those old trains uh, really got you interested? I'm not sure. Um, it's, it's like when you ask anybody what it is about their favourite childhood toys that appealed to them, it's very difficult to put your finger on something in particular. There was something about the whole package of trains if you will that I think must have appealed to me the creativity the imagination and the fact that uh, you know you had these huge engineering marvels in miniature at your beck and command so to speak and it, it just really gelled with me and I, I think you know I, I got on very well with my father still do and it led into going to shows, going to preserved railways, going to shops together. And so I think there's a whole package of all of that, which is why I look back at my childhood and my childhood interest in model railways with a great deal of fondness and have carried that on. So you mentioned going to the shows. Uh, you did actually exhibit at several shows, didn't you? We've uh, seen the uh, the footage on your channel of the the old shows you went to in the nineties. Can you tell us uh, are those old shows different to the shows and exhibitions that you have now, or are they pretty much the same? No, uh, what we actually went to was uh, they were called steam fairs. They still, you know, outside of COVID times, still go on, and. Um, uh, we used to go to these and exhibit in, they used to have either like a model marquee or a collections marquee. And um, going right back to, I think 1990 was the first year that we exhibited what was ostensibly my father's um, Hornby 003 rail train set. So it was very different from model shows, um, um, which uh, obviously were going on back then we didn't exhibit at very many of those. I think we did a couple. Um, so in that respect, the experience of then is very different to the shows I go to now, but that's only because we've changed the type of shows that we're going to, if, if that makes sense to you. It does, yes. Uh, I, it, it was a bit confusing for me. As a non-trained person who hasn't been to any of these exhibitions, they look pretty much the same when you, you've seen the ex the uh, layouts on, on show so uh, that that's quite a, a nice insight I think but we have got a fair few Patreon questions so the first one I've got here is from Sparky107107 who has said Jenny you have done many wonderful things within the hobby tv shows to traveling to taking part in the longest model railroad that spans a country so in saying that what would be your dream outing or project that you would like to do when it comes to the hobby if anything was possible Hi Sparky, thank you very much for your question and um, 
My, my dream thing, um, I like the idea of modeling full size, the idea of actually rocking up and maybe for a TV program, reinstating a railway. Yeah, you know, kind of like how we did with Biggest Little Railway, but doing that on a full size basis, take a disused line and reinstate it with volunteer labor, almost do that over um, a week or two weeks as a challenge type thing. You know, a, a kind of time team meets ground force meets challenge Annika. And I think that that would not only make great television, but it would be tremendous fun to do. And I think that all model, uh, model railway people or model railroad people would also really like that kind of idea of modeling on a one-to-one -one scale. So a kind of challenge, Jennifer. <laughs> well, yes, um, but obviously I'd, I'd need a TV company behind me to, um, to pay the bills. But yeah, I think that that would be a great thing to do. That's an interesting answer. That, so where, do you have anywhere in, in particular in mind that you would want to go to, to reinstate this line? You'd have to take a small section. You, you know, in two weeks, you couldn't reinstate an entire line. It's just physically not possible. But there's, um, there, there are chunks of railway in Oswestry um, to reconnect the preserved line there back to the, the main line. The track is still there, just hasn't been used for decades. Um, there are other places, like, for example, taking on things like, for example, on the Bluebell line. Uh, they have long term aspirations to put back in the Ardingly line and maybe an idea of taking a very short section of that line and doing that as a TV thing. Um, but then also um, the Gotham branch line on uh, the Great Central Railway. Um, there's plenty of scope to put part of that back in from the main line and uh, in a sort of similar vein to what they did with the Montserrat branch at Swithland. Um, so there are plenty of places where you could do something like that. And I think any one of them would be a perfect nucleus for the project. So it sounds like actually, if the project was a success on TV, you could have follow-ups where you did other lines. Yeah, you could make it a TV series. That would be nice. Okay, we've got a question from Andy Finch, who says, uh, if you had the chance to start from scratch on We Are Yard, what would you build? Hi, Andy. Thank you for your question. Now, it's an interesting uh, question because every time I build a model layout, it's almost like I'm scratching a modeling itch. I'm getting something out of my system. So, for example, when I built um, Grove Street Yard, that was scratching that itch that I was really fascinated with Trafford Park and some like those really um, tucked away industrial settings and building that layout got that out of my system. When I built Bolton Trinity Road out in my garden shed, that was because I'd always fancied building a model of Trinity Street Station in Bolton. And I got that out of my system. Weir Yard is a, a very, very long held ambition to build a homage to Tyne Yard. And now I've done that. I think if I was starting again, I've got Tyne Yard out of my system. And what I really like the idea of is somewhere like Kirby Stephen East Station, maybe doing from the station and the junction all the way through, compressed, of course, across the Podgill viaduct with the branch to Hartley Quarry, all the way to Bella viaduct. And in my head, I love this idea of building Bella viaduct on a grand scale, really deep, and using maybe 3D printing to make up the components of that cast iron viaduct that was, and building that. And yeah, and I think once I built that, it would be a case of, of moving on and doing something else. So there's always a new project that I would do. I never go back and do the same thing twice, if that makes sense. And uh, it's something that we were talking about just the other night, isn't it? When you were saying that you would have liked to have put uh, a viaduct onto a weir yard. And uh, when you saw the outro on one of your videos after we did the uh, premiere last night, you were saying, 
wow, doesn't that uh, old stuff from Bolton Trinity Road look uh, look less developed than what you are in, uh, now with your skills? So there's always that case of, in order to get to where you are now, you've got to have done the previous thing. So yeah. do you see that I being an expansion? Yeah, very much. Uh, railway modelling is like so many other things. The more you do it, the better you get at it. We didn't just turn up and go, oh, today I shall try railway modelling and suddenly be amazing. It, it's a learning curve. You learn skills, you hone skills, just as if you went into, um, you know, competing in, in karate, taekwondo or doing gymnastics or, you know, doing competitive um uh, um, like mountain biking, things like that, all these different things, motorsport, um, sailing. It's the more you do it, the better you get at it. And railway modelling is just like that. Absolutely, yes. And it always reminds me of that line from Adventure Time, the cartoon. To, to be really good at something, you have to start uh, by sucking at something. And uh, you, that's how it is. You, you start off with uh, fewer skills and build up. So we've got a question now from Robert Steers, who says that before COVID, did you ever have multiple person operating sessions? Hi, Robert. Thanks for the question. And um, yeah, we had visitors here. Um, and even you know, going back to when I had the Garden Railway and Bolton Trinity Road in the shed, you know, you'd have a friend or a couple of friends round and you'd kind of, um, you know, play trains for want of a better expression. But in terms of multiple operator sessions, uh, Weir Yard is the first time that I've built a layout where you can run a lot of trains at the same time. And theoretically, you could have multiple operators. All the others, it was just simply a case of letting a train run and there wasn't much to do other than talk trains whilst trains were going round. Um, we have had people up here um, uh, and we have done like uh, running different trains and stuff, nothing in the way of like shunting, um, but there is the facility to plug in more than one handset. So we could have multiple operators and certainly once COVID comes to an end, that is something that I can do. Um, I, I'd love to get guests back up in the loft. Worked really well with the Monday Club uh, and just from a social point of view. And I've really missed that. You know, we're looking at nearly a year since I've really had any proper visitors and uh, I miss it. So that is something for the future. Absolutely. We, I think we both miss having uh, guests on the Monday Club. Uh, Les is a particularly fond uh, guest. He, he is always here and uh, we haven't seen him for so long. Yeah. And uh, Les, when you watch this, I am missing your visits. We had some great times together and I know he's moved house, actually. He's he's no longer just up the road. He's moved um, down the country, actually, a, a, probably a couple of hours drive away. Um, and it's not going to be the same without you, Les, but we will sort something out. OK, Robert has a uh, follow up question as well. He says, uh, have you ever published a diagram of your layout so that people could understand the scope of your work? Um, I'm not very good at drawing diagrams of what I build. Um, I have a, a very, very um, <laughs> I'm trying to think of the way of describing it in my head. It's like a CAD program and I can, in, in the, the realm of my mind, I can manipulate things, work out how they fit together, work out how to make the individual parts go together. And um, I know sometimes it amazes people that I can just sort of, I almost sort of deanimate for a day, like I'm thinking very hard. And then I will just start making something and the most incredible complex bits of um, uh, machinery, um, DIY, just appears, but there is never a technical drawing to show how it all goes together because that's the bit that I can't do. When it comes to Weir Yard, um, there will be a track plan uh, published in, uh, in Weir Yard is gonna feature in the next issue of Railway Modeler. And as part of that, they got me to draw 
a pencil diagram of where all the tracks go. And I despise doing that because I hate drawing technical drawings. I'm just not very good at it. So I provided a very crude diagram to them. And I'm hoping that their graphic artist will, in conjunction with the photographs that were taken, will produce a much better drawing of Weir Yard. And um, so that is probably the closest you're going to get to seeing what the plan of Weir Yard actually looks like. I think we'll all look forward to that. So we have a few more questions. In fact, we have a fair amount of questions. Uh, let's uh, move straight on. We have a question here from uh, Helen Sink, who says, uh, I have several questions. I would be very happy if you could answer any of them. Uh, the first being, uh, what was it about model railways that you first found so appealing? Uh, hi, Helen. Thank you very much for the question. Um, again, it probably harks back to the question that you asked me right at the start. Um, I, I think it was, I like machines, machinery, things that are mechanical, um, the more complicated the better. So it's not just trains that I like. I have a love of, of ships, steam engines, diesel engines, um, all manner of, of uh, heavy equipment like um, mine lifting gear, pumping equipment. Um, I find it all fascinating. Cars, so, you know, we did a parallel series for a while on the channel, the Volvo log following me restoring a uh, Volvo 850S. So there's a lot going on in the background that doesn't actually necessarily make it to the channel that my, you know, my interests are very varied. And um, I actually went to university to do a master's engineering degree, but for complex reasons, I came out the other end with a degree in environmental philosophy. I did, I, I, you know, I accidentally changed course or something. And it's probably one of my big regrets that I didn't stick out the engineering degree. It was very complicated. Um, it, it wasn't, you know, it, it wasn't the course itself. There were other reasons that I changed. And I do regret that because, um, Engineering is a big deal to me. I love it. And even though I'm not formally qualified, I, I know principles. I know how to make things. I know how things work. Um, so I think it's probably a lost calling. But that's probably why I like machinery, mechanical things. And that includes trains. Would you, uh, if you had the chance, would you go back to university and do a second degree and get, get an engineering degree? I think it's too late for me now. Um, it's never I too I, late to go back. No, 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 no. Uh, I feel that um, the time is is has passed for that. Um, it hasn't held me back uh, in terms of what I want to do in life. And um, yeah, I mean, I, th there've been occasions where it's a little bit infuriating where you do things and you're not treated as an expert in a field because you've not got the qualification, but you know as much as the person who got that piece of paper because that's your area of interest. And you know, you, you, you know just because you didn't sit an exam doesn't mean you know anything less about it. Um, but um, I think that the direction of my life and the things that I do it doesn't fit in with going back to university for, you know, if I did it full time, it's a four year course to do uh, to get an MEng degree, which was what I would have got had I um, not dropped off that course for very personal reasons. Well, Helen's uh, second question, uh, this should be very interesting for you, especially given that you've uh, had a number of packages arrive today. She says, uh, if money was unlimited, what would you buy for your collection right now? One of everything. <laughs> I have a bit of a magpie eye uh, for, you know, it's like, oh, shiny, oh, shiny. So I know that there's people who are very keenly focused and they'll be like, you know, I will only buy things that are suitable for this period, this livery in this part of the country that I model and I'm very focused and I will not be interested in anything else. I can't do that. So, for example, today I have just, just uh, got out of the box before we started filming this locomotive and it's just simply so pretty that I couldn't resist it. 
I've got a purple, a BR Experimental Purple A4 coming. I've just bought a BR Green Class 15. I've got my eye on a BR Tops Blue Class 55 from uh, Acura Scale. So I have these very varied interests, um, which unfortunately means that I buy lots of stuff from lots of eras, lots of geographical locations, and it gets very expensive. So a short answer, one of everything would be absolutely fine. Thank you very much. <laughs> now, that surprises me because the amount of love that you seem to have for that five-inch scale ride-on locomotive that uh, when uh, Ollie from uh, Wardle Road got you down south to try out, I would have thought that that would have been your immediate answer. Um yeah, I'll have one of everything of that as well. Uh, I, I do love the idea of, in fact, my father makes model engineered one third scale steam traction engines. They work, they're about the size of a Mini Cooper. They weigh slightly more than a Mini Cooper because they're quite, there's a lot of metal in them. And, you know, for, for decades, I've assisted my father in running these things. So I'm actually quite a proficient steam engine driver, which, which was annoying in a way. When we did Biggest Little Railway, they were like, yeah, yeah, whatever. And other people got to drive the steam engine. And it's like, you know, I've been driving these things for like 25 years, something like that. And I didn't get a look in. And I was very jealous about that. Um, so uh, at the moment, I'm trying to persuade him as his next project to build a five inch gauge standard class four, two, six, four tank locomotive, ostensibly so I can actually operate that on a, a line like the one that Ollie very, very kindly um, took us to. Well, we have another question from Helen. Uh, I'm just going to keep going through these. Uh, a very interesting one. I think this will uh, uh, keep you going for a bit. What is a mistake? that many people new to the hobby make? Um, I think probably, I mean, there's there's quite a few. And, um, you know, we've all made these mistakes at the start. Um, improper baseboard construction uh, is, is a biggie. Uh, people get very excited. They want to get to the fun stuff. And, you know, it's like, I'll chuck, out, chuck down a piece of board, a piece of MDF or, you know, a piece of chipboard, and that'll be fine. Yes, it's flat when it first goes down, but these things sag over time if you don't brace them, if you don't build the structure underneath properly. And I think there are a lot of people who've fallen foul of that uh, because, you know, it's like woodwork's boring. That's not railway modelling. You know, I want to get to the fun stuff. The other thing is the electrical side of things. It's very easy to bang the track down, start working on the scenery and neglect a lot of the wiring and then find that that brings in a lot of problems later down the line. Um, so they're probably two of the biggest things. One of the other things actually, which surprised me, I was watching some of Hornby's videos where um, Mike from Hornby and also Simon Cole as well built their first ever layouts. And what surprised me was that they laid the ballast first and then put the track on top of the ballast. And I've never seen anybody do that before. And all I could think was that's storing up problems. Um, so I guess, you know, if nobody's, uh, you know, if, if you've just been thrown in the deep end, there are a lot of these very easy to make pitfalls. Because, you know, on the real railway, they lay the ballast first, put the track down and then, you know, top up the ballast afterwards. But building a model railway is not necessarily quite the same as building a real railway. Which of those uh, mistakes have you personally made? All except for the ballast one. I did do ballast properly from the start because I I, um, I researched by reading magazines as it was back then. You know, the internet wasn't, was no more than a little nerdy curiosity. You couldn't, you know, there's no Wikipedia or Google or anything. Um, you know, you, you just had to find out either by reading magazines or trial and error. But I made rubbish baseboards out of MDF that bowed, were far too heavy, but actually had no real strength to them. Um, I laid track without too much thought on the electrics and had huge numbers of problems uh, because of that. Um, so they're the two biggies that I've done. Well, it's always nice to show that uh, even people that really know what they're doing now had to learn somehow so yeah, it, it's a it's a good role model essentially uh, probably the wrong word for for newcomers to the to the hobby that even 
the people that they might look up to uh, have all made the same mistakes. Mm -hmm. So we have another uh, question from Helen who says, uh, what bit of advice saved you the most money in the hobby? Uh, probably measure twice, cut once. Oh. And that, that applies to anything. From pieces of wood when you do woodwork, don't assume your first measurement is correct because tape measures are sneaky little things and they go when you're not looking. So measure twice. Be certain before you cut because, um, you know, you cut that piece of wood slightly too short, a piece of track slightly too short. You're going to go through a lot of money and it's very infuriating as well. So that's probably the simplest but most beneficial bit of advice I could give out. That's actually a really good point because the it's easy done and a slip of the concentration and all of a sudden you're, you're spending more money than you thought you had to. And there's a, a train or a carriage gone that you could have had. Yeah. So uh, Helen's final question, which... Uh, Personally, I, I'm the most invested in on this one. Uh, do you and Zoe plan to do any more sci-fi chats in the future? Yes, um, we, we, we always bandy around ideas. We've got a few ideas. I know we did kind of a big tranche of them last time and we tend to go in spurts. We'll do maybe a dozen and then nothing for a year and then we'll maybe do another dozen or so and then nothing for a year. So we're probably about due for another a series of sci-fi chat um but we've been so busy with other things um and that's got in the way of other things i know i know we've had covid so there's no real excuse because we haven't been able to go out and visit places but we just we'll get around to it yeah it's one of those things that it might we say covid might have been a, a thing because uh, we're stuck at home but your job and my job haven't actually changed I worked from home anyway, and you're a key worker. So actually, yeah. COVID hasn't impacted uh, our work time as much as uh, it might have for other people. If so, anything, I've never been so busy. Yeah, and that's the problem, the busyness. But uh, we'll, we will get there. We'll have another series of them. Uh, let's have a look at what else we've got. We have uh, a few questions from oorail.co.uk where he's asked, uh, have you ever considered picking up a 3D printer as a tool to use on your model railway? Hi, OO Rail. Uh, thanks for the question. And yes, uh, I have to say, I've been, I've been eyeing 3D printers with interest. But what you've got to remember is the computer side of things, I'm not necessarily the greatest on. Um, my computer still runs XP, or at least the computer that I know how to use properly and that I use when I write my books is running XP. Uh, which people are like, XP, what, what, what on earth was that? Um, but, you know, I'm still using Word 97 because I'm just, you know, it, it does what I need. I'm happy with it. So when it comes to, like, the CAD work required, I would feel very out of my depth. But I see the value of it in the hobby. Um, and certainly a friend of mine, Paul Tyre at PD Models, uses it extensively. I've seen the results and very, very impressed with it. And like we've talked about, actually, to go back to sci-fi chat, this is where the Star Trek replicator starts. This is the beginning of that technology. Um, so I think, it, you know, it's here to stay and it's just going to get better. Um, and when it becomes very, very user friendly, where you can you just walk over, uh, over to a thing in the wall and go, computer, print me an A4 Pacific in this livery and this number and give it, uh, you know, Steam functionality, this, that and the other. And it just appears when it's that user friendly, then I'm on board. I honestly thought you were going to go TL Grey Hot. <laughs> <laughs> I was tempted, but I, I really can't stand tea, Earl Grey hot. It is the most revolting of substances you can drink. Fair enough. Well, we do have a follow on question from that. Uh, Earl Rail also asks, have you ever looked into building brass or white metal locomotives? Um, I, I'm aware of their existence, but what you've got to remember is that... Um, I'm a big advocate in the hobby of things that you don't enjoy doing. Don't, you know, don't beat yourself up over. If, you know, if there's something in the hobby that you really don't feel like doing, find a way around it because hobbies are supposed to be fun. And the idea of building a locomotive doesn't really appeal to me. Now, I've never tried building a locomotive, 
but I have built wagon kits. And I'll be honest with you, I didn't find it a fulfilling process. Yes, I did it. I completed them. I finished them and I actually finished them to a reasonable standard. I was, you know, happy with the finish, but I didn't enjoy the process. So I vowed that it was something that I wouldn't go out of my way to do again because of that. You're absolutely right, though. Uh, if you don't enjoy doing something as someone else does, you've got to weigh the pros and cons of maybe getting them to do it instead, even if it costs a little bit more. Mm hmm. So Owen Real then asks, uh, what do you think of the new Hornby site? The site seems like they are developing it as they go. So uh, for a company like Hornby, it seems kind of sloppy to mess a website up that badly. Would you agree with that? I think it's very easy to do. Um, you, know, you have to adapt websites for various reasons, a lot of it on the back end to protect it from being hacked. Uh, but um, it's, yeah, the Hornby website at least is still got some degree of user friendliness. You can find what you want. Uh, not mentioning any names, but another manufacturer upgraded their website. And actually, it was a massive downgrade and it lost all of the functionality. It lost all of the ease of use. And I'll be honest, I ceased using it as a first port of call. Um, place to go and find out information about their products uh, and that to me is like I don't know who they paid to do that but um, it was wasted money. Hornby's website changes at least do seem functionally okay. There's always going to be teething troubles when you launch a new website because no matter how much you test this stuff offline first there's always something slightly unforeseen um, and you've got to remember people are rocking up with a vast variety of browser, PC and hardware combinations uh, running different resolutions on their monitors and all sorts of things which can cause some unforeseen effects. Uh, but by and large, I think it, it seems OK and I think they'll smooth out those teething problems. Yeah, even the, the big websites, Facebook, Twitter and things, they change things all the time and no one likes it. And then... Uh -huh. No, because Facebook are very good at taking away all the features you found useful and going, here's some junk and garbage to ruin your experience and hide most of your friends from ever having what they're posting shown to you again. I dislike that. Bit of a sore issue there, Jen. Wow. So yeah. perhaps this perhaps this will be better for you. Oh, Rail goes on to say, where do you buy your rolling stock from? I buy my rolling stock from a variety of sources. Um, I'm not wedded to one retailer above all else regardless. Now, I do buy a lot from Rails of Sheffield because I've had great service there and they carry a great range and it's pretty much usually at a very competitive price. But as people will have seen in recent videos, I've also bought a lot from Hereford Model Center um, and made the mistake of going, hey, everybody, look at this new old stock. It's great value for money. Before I bought everything I wanted, and then you guys went and bought all the stuff that I had my eye on. Whoops. Um, but then also Cheltenham Model Centre, Durham Trains of Stanley, um, Arcadia Models in Shaw, Bolton Model Mart, uh, 53A Models, Invicta Models. Um, I'm just trying to think where else. Uh, Kerno Model Centre. Hattons, um, where else do I go? I used to get used to get stuff from transport models in Preston a lot as well. Uh, Harbin Hobbies up in Edinburgh. I, I I bought a lot of stuff mail order from various places. Um, so I do spread my buying around. Basically, it seems like uh, if there's something out there that you want, you will find it, regardless I, of who has it. Yeah, I have skills. I will find it. <laughs> a very specific set of skills yes okay final question that we have uh, is uh, again from our rail saying do you ever watch layout updates from dave over at dean park station um very very occasionally but not often um I, due to my busy schedule it's very difficult for me to keep up and watch a lot of other people's channels there are probably only about um, three or four channels that I avidly watch every video they put out. And they're not necessarily the ones you would expect. Um, uh, they're not necessarily even railway related. I follow Tyler Hoover, 
uh, Hoovy's Garage, which is a car thing in America. I've uh, been avidly watching his channel since he only had about 20,000 subscribers. Um, and uh, Martin Zero as well. Again, I've uh, been watching him since he only had a couple of thousand subscribers and he's now a huge channel. Uh, oh, and Tech Moan as well. So they're probably the three channels that I avidly consume and then I dip in and out of lots and lots of others. I think dipping in and out is the only way to do it these days. There's so much content on YouTube and the model yeah. railway hobby is, uh, I don't know from my point of view, it seems to have exploded, especially during the pandemic. So as people making channels left, right and centre, it has become almost impossible. I think it probably technically is impossible to catch up on every single video from every single person. So as a final question from our side, what would you say was the best tip that anyone could have to actually get seen on Model Railway uh, in, in the Model Railway scene at this point? I think that to get it, it's, uh, if there was a magic answer, everybody would be huge on, on YouTube. Um, you know, I do get asked, like, how do you get successful on YouTube? If I knew I'd be more successful and would have done it quicker. Um, I think it's about making videos that you want to make. Don't chase the views because you will kind of, you might get lucky with one or two clickbaity things, but it will kind of make you typecast as well. Um, and um, there doesn't seem to be a magic formula, or if there is, nobody's told me what it is. It's just perseverance, making videos that you love and you will come across as sincere and as interesting, hopefully. Um, because that's all I do. I just make videos that I think, oh, this is interesting. Um, and I always feel honoured when people watch them. OK, well, thank you so much, Jennifer. It's uh, been lovely to have a conversation with you. And uh, that's uh, from what I've uh, just uh, checked over. That is all of the questions from our Patreon backers, well, from your Patreon backers. So I'd like to say thank you so much to everyone who did ask a question, because it really is appreciated. And uh, thank you very much to Jennifer for taking uh, a bit of time out to talk to us. That's great. Thank you ever so much. And thank you to all the Patreons who uh, submitted a question. That is, of course, one of the benefits of being a patron of the channel, being able to ask questions for these Q&A videos, but also you get access to the Friday video early. And uh, depending on which tier you go for, there are other rewards too. OK, well, thank you very much and uh, take care. Thank you very much and take care as well. And um, I hope to see you soon. Happy modelling. Bye for now. Today's video is sponsored by Trainomatic, makers of DCC decoders designed to be fully compatible with every manufacturer's locomotive. Visit train-o-matic.com to browse the full range and see what they've got suitable for you. I'd like to send out a huge thanks to everybody who supports me on Patreon. And an extra special huge thanks goes out to Anthony Kidson, Wayne Johns, Offshore Allen, OORail.co.uk, Michael Lockie, Helen Sink, Peter Bolton, Brian and Dorothy Mudd, Gary Lewis, David Quinn, Sparky107107, George Botterini, Andy Finch, Chris Moss, Robert Steers, MD of San Juan Model Company and Grantline Products, Sam Yates, John N. from NC, and NYMR-ish. Thank you. Without you guys, I couldn't do this.